ran an event as a centre not that long ago. There was a young lecturer from one of the colleges in Glasgow there, very attractive woman, well turned out in her mid-twenties. And she said, I feel like I'm of a ge different generation from these young girls that I'm teaching. She said, many of them are saying they take three hours in the morning to get ready to go to college. Three hours. Just think what you could be doing with that time. Um, I said to someone who's working in retail the other day about Glasgow. You know, Glasgow sells itself on the basis of materialism. And, you know, it's now Scotland with style. And she, she corrected me and she said, no, she said, Glasgow's not about style, it's about brands. And she then went on to say, you know, Glasgow's love affair with brands is such that when Hunter Wellies, expensive Wellies, for those who don't know about this, came out for kids, there was a queue outside the shop to get them. And she's saying, are they not just well? What happened to the ones that have got eyes on them? Or, you know, animals painted and, you know, why do you need Gucci? Sorry, that's my next thing. Why do we need Hunter Wellies for kids? And then the, the, the other thing that she said was that all the rage in Glasgow at the moment is Gucci dummy tits, <laughs> which cost £30, right? Now, this is the problem, I think, is that because a lot of people feel bad about themselves in lots of ways, feel they have to put on some kind of display they're then trying to badge themselves with these kind of things that do nothing for their well-being or their family's well-being. Um, and that is where we've got to with this. And no one is saying there's something not right about this. There's something fundamentally wrong with this set of values. And of course, they're coming from the media. They're coming from just about everywhere in life uh, as well, politics as well. Um, if we look at exposure to television, it's a major conduit for, for, uh, for, for materialist values. You can see that Scotland is particularly prone because the average television viewing in, in Scotland is five hours a day. It's four and a half in, the, in, in England, I think. Uh, this is kind of of American proportions of, of television viewing and a lot of it's commercial television in the, the west of Scotland. Now, there's a lot of research that says that there's a lot of issues with people watching a lot of telly. If you watch just a few programmes a day, the chances are you think television's an asset in your life and you like it, and there are a lot of good things to watch. But the problem is that television makes people very apathetic. Even when people watch things that they've chosen to watch, their mood is often recorded as just below apathetic because it demands nothing of you. And I'm sure if you've sat all night watching the telly and you go to your bed, you will be aware of that feeling. It's a kind of empty, unchallenged sort of feeling. And when people live their lives like that, it can be very dissatisfying for them. Um, lack of exercise is all, also going to be an issue, lack of social contact. But the other big thing is about social comparison. It is a pretty natural thing for us to do to compare ourselves with other people. Now, as a result of television and the media in general, we're being asked to compare ourselves with the rich and the famous who don't even look like that anyway. Cindy Crawford said she didn't wake up in the morning looking like Cindy Crawford. Um, and you can see why these kind of contrast effects are actually quite damaging for how people feel about themselves. And I think this is one of the reasons why there is a bit of an obsession about self-esteem, because that kind of media is quite damaging to how people feel about themselves and their partners. So the more you're exposed to that, the more critical you can be of your life and the more you can feel like you're a loser or whatever because of all this comparison that's going on. Then add adverts into the mix, because the whole thing about adverts is it's about trying to sow the seeds of dissatisfaction in people's lives so that they will want different things. So I think that there is a, there's a major issue here that I think people are not adequately talking about, um, and I think it is linked to some of the loss of well-being statistics that we're seeing. But for young people in, in particular, they're exposed to screens for around five hours a day. I've read seven hours more recently often looking at various screens at the same time. Um, almost 90% of teenagers in the UK have a personal television, um, as does 60% of five to six-year-olds, often in their own bedroom. In other words, that they can be watching it unsupervised and as they go to sleep at night. 
Two thirds of those between seven and 16 have internet access from their bedrooms. And again, that is often unsupervised. Someone said to me recently that one of the most helpful things that someone had said to him about the internet is it's not a thing, it's a place. The internet is a place that your children are visiting unescorted a lot of the time. Would you let your child do that? Go to gambling dens and, you know, um, strip parlors. You wouldn't allow them to do that. Well, effectively, you are, because that's what the internet is for people. Uh, Agnes Nairn, who I'm going to talk a bit about her research in a minute or two, points out that we used to think of children in the early years of life anyway as being under the influence of, of their parents and teachers and, to some extent, friends. That's just not true anymore. <coughs> Children's time in front of a screen is more than double their time in class, and it's more than one and a half times the time they spend with their parents. They are being greatly influenced by that whole commercial world, um, more so than their parents in many ways. I'm just going to take a, a couple of examples about the type of effect this is having on young people. Um, for example, research found that 40% of teenage girls said that they've considered plastic surgery. Research published in the British Journal of Developmental Psychology found that 71% of seven-year-olds want to be thinner and they think that they would be more popular if they were. Another study found uh, that half of girls aged 14 say it's important to be attractive to boys. Uh, that's 50% higher than it had been 10 years before, and a very similar increase can be seen in boys. So this is all about the values of what you look like, how you're seen by other people as becoming much, much more important in people's lives than it was when we were young. There's, there's really, I think, um, we should be much more concerned about the very cynical way that companies and marketing experts are trying to target children and doing it very effectively uh, as consumers. If you take something like the Disney Princess range, there are 26,000 products in that range. Uh, one educational psychologist puts it as... She said this, playing princess is not the issue. The issue is 26,000 products. When one thing is so dominant, then it's no longer a choice. It's a mandate, cannibalizing all other forms of play. There's the illusion of more choices around out there for girls. But if you look around, you'll see their choices are steadily narrowing. You know, there's other things like, you know, some companies that sell razors have a lot of, uh, of internet games on their, on their website. They're not selling to children at the moment, but they are seeing them as future market share. And that's what they're very cynically doing, is they're trying to get this brand loyalty so that in the future, when these kids shave or whatever, they'll be using their products. Pester power is what the advertising industry talks about, getting to kids as consumers because they will influence uh, the adults in their house uh, and their spending power. And they're very aware that this is much more likely now because of indulgent parenting, where parents let their children make these kind of decisions for them. 